people ask, oh, how much should we grow of this specific thing? There's so many different variables. Like the weather is going to be different, different years, the soil health, there's different varieties that you can grow. Some will bear more than others, whether or not you prune and make the most of what you have, how much you fertilize, if you trellis things, there's so many different variables. We just learned that from year to year, things are gonna be so different. I like to just grow more than I think I need. And often then one thing will do really well and then other things won't do quite as well. My name is Lisa, mother of eight and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, we're going to be chatting with Michelle Knox of the More Than Farmers YouTube channel. I was inspired when I came across a video that she and her husband did that is called Strategies to Grow an Entire Year's Worth of Food from a Small Homestead. I thought that it was very well presented in the way they shared the things that they do differently in upcoming years, the failures from the first couple of years of starting it, priority crops, priority foods to raise and grow. <laughs> I have my baby waking up. And I wanted to chat with her about that. They're very knowledgeable and I think they can inspire a lot of you. All right, so let's dive into this interview. Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining me. I was just re-watching your YouTube video that inspired this episode. So you and your husband were talking about all the things that you are raising to completely sustain your family on a small homestead and avoiding the grocery store and all of this stuff. So I wanted to dig into some of that because a lot of us have that idea, but then, you know, we didn't grow up this way. We don't really know like how to troubleshoot when things go wrong. So let's just start with introductions. Tell me about you and your homestead. Uh, I don't think I saw like what size it was. Is it a couple acres or what kind of homestead are you on? Yeah, it's really good to be here with you, Lisa. I have followed your podcast for a long time, so it's really nice to be here with you. Oh, um, my name is Michelle, for those of you who don't know, and um, we live here on a five and a half acre homestead. I have four kids and... Yeah, we've been homesteading for about, oh, I'm going to say 10 or 11 years now. We've been married for 11 years and we have been homesteading for, I think we started homesteading like the second year that we were married. So I was raised as a Mennonite. And so I learned a lot of these skills growing up. So when people ask me how long I've been homesteading, it's like, well, I mean, 10 years as a married person on my own, but I definitely learned all of these skills as a child. So I've been doing this pretty much all of my life. We have five and a half acres and that's more than enough for us right now um, to raise the food that we need. So we don't buy like, we don't grow all of our own food, but I would say a solid 75%, something like that. But then we will round it out with some like dried bulk goods from Azure Standard or bulkfood.com, Dutch Valley, places like that. Okay, so you're not running into Aldi or Walmart on the regular basis. For the most part, you're raising what you can and then getting a few different things that you order, which is really impressive because you you realize how many things you have to do differently whenever you're trying to eat from your own homestead. So for example, you have a video on where you, it shows you on the thumbnail, like holding coconut oil in one hand, and then I'm assuming lard or tallow or something in the other hand, because coconut oil isn't something that you can grow on your homestead. So what are some other swaps that you do that we take for granted that this is something that everybody buys and you're you're making a switch to something that you can actually grow on your own homestead? Yeah. Um, so yeah, some swaps that we do. Like I make all of my own bread. We don't ever buy bread from the grocery store. Coconut oil, we'll swap that out for tallow because we butcher our own beef all of our vegetables we grow here on the homestead rather than buying them from the store. We still buy some fruit because our apple trees and things like that aren't completely mature yet. And so we're still, we're still doing things like that, but we're definitely growing a solid 75% of our food, I would say. And so I'm not going to the grocery store all the time. The main things that I buy at the grocery store are things like peanut butter, chocolate chips, and then like the baking soda oils or avocado oil. If I need like a liquid oil, 
We do still buy some things like apple juice and grape juice, but we do have like grape vines and apple trees and things like that that we're hoping to be able to make our own juice in the future. So yeah, I can't think offhand of like more swaps, but yeah. Well, I think maybe because you grew up this way, it's second nature to you to eat seasonally, to think of the food that you have in a little bit of a different way that allows you to be able to raise 75% of your food. Because if we wanted to completely replace maybe what we're already buying in a standard American home with stuff that we grow, a lot of the things you wouldn't even be able to. And so there's those shifts in the the way that you eat around different seasons. Yeah. Let's talk about, in your video, you talked about some of the failures, or not failures, but some things you learned from previous years, like, oh, we didn't grow enough potatoes, or maybe we grew the wrong kind of potatoes that didn't store as well. What are some of the things that you learned whenever trying to grow food for your family in the first couple of years that changed how you did it the next couple of years? So the first thing that came to mind when you asked, you know, things that we've learned uh, last year, we ran out of potatoes. And what we had forgotten to take into account was that our family is growing. And so we have to grow a little bit more every year in the stage of life that we're in because our kids are growing so fast. And so just, you know, keeping all of the variables in mind like that is something that we have learned a lot. Another thing that we've learned is that there's so many variables, like people ask, oh, how much should we grow of this specific thing? And it's like, well, you know, there's so many different variables in how something does, like the weather is going to be different, different years, um, the soil health, your soil might be have different health than mine. There's different varieties that you can grow that will some will bear more than others. There's also the thing of how much you prune, how much, you know, whether or not you prune and make the most of what you have, how much you fertilize, if you trellis things, there's so many different variables. And so I think I got a little bit sidetracked from your question there. But yeah, there's, we just learned that from year to year, things are going to be so different. And I like to just grow more than I think I need. And often then one thing will do really well and then other things won't do quite as well. And it all just kind of ends up coming out in the wash at the end. Like there's always there's always enough food to go around. But yeah, it's definitely definitely a learning experience to figure out how much you'll need of one thing. So Yes, definitely. And like you said, with the kids, adding more kids and them growing, it's sort of a moving target on how much you actually need. So what are some of your staple crops, your priority crops and why? Like which things mm -hmm. Do you feel like will nourish your family the best, maybe for the least effort or for the least space? There's that balance of trying to figure out how to best utilize your time and your property. What are those staples for you guys? Yeah. So we kind of have this philosophy for ourselves. So the things that we grow, they have to be easy to grow in our climate. They have to have minimal pest pressure. And then another thing that we really like to do is grow things that you don't, that take like minimal preserving, like potatoes and sweet potatoes and carrots and things like that. You can just bring them in and put them in your root cellar. You don't actually have to like put them into jars and do all sorts of canning and preserving and things like that. And then also they have to be filling and nutritious. So like lettuce isn't going to be terribly filling and you're not, it's not going to have like a long shelf life, things like that. So kind of our, what we think of as our staple crops here in our homestead is white potatoes. Those are so easy to grow, at least here, if you have really nice soil, potatoes really want that loose soil. So we focus on potatoes and then sweet potatoes, which are super easy as well. Carrots, butternut squash, onions, broccoli, and tomatoes. I would say those are my staple crops. And a lot of them are super easy, like broccoli. Um, you don't have to, like, you just cut off the head and then you don't have to do all the snipping like you would green beans and things like that. And then I just like quickly blanch the broccoli, throw it in freezer bags and you're done. So I would say those are, are definitely the crops that I would, if I planted a garden and could only pick a few things, I would absolutely start with potatoes, carrots and squash and then broccoli and tomatoes, things like that. 
Yes. I really like the idea of picking things that on the the back end on harvest time won't require you to put up all this stuff because that's where a lot of us fall apart. We have really high ambitions in the spring. And then when it comes time to harvesting it all, we're still just as busy as we always were. And yet now we need to actually figure out how we're going to keep it throughout the winter. So what are some of your ways that you do that? With How do you store your potatoes, your butternut squash, your onions, your garlic, your carrots? And then I'm assuming with tomatoes, are you canning, freezing? What's your method for that? Yes, absolutely. So with white potatoes, we just bring those in and we cure them in our basement. And curing them sounds like this big fancy word, but really all that it is, is we lay our potatoes out in our basement on tables. And our basement is relatively humid, like it's not super dry. We have a dehumidifier going down there. But we lay out our potatoes and just let them completely dry out. Any little bruises will heal over. And the temp down in our basement is, I'm going to say, somewhere from probably around 60 to 65 degrees. And once they've been laying out for two weeks is usually what I do. We just put them into crates and put them into our root cellar. For sweet potatoes, we do the exact same thing. Curing is actually so easy. Um, We also cure our butternut squash. For butternut squash, they love to be in the sun. And so I will bring our butternut squash in, lay them out on the porch, let them, I kind of put them in a place that's not full sun, but just sort of shady and sun some of the day. And I leave them out there for about two weeks, make sure that everything around the stem is all dried up. And then I can take those down to the root cellar as well. Onions are a little bit different. They love to be cured in the sun. Um, They're different from the white potatoes. They're not different from the butternut squash, but I like to just set them in the sun outside, let them dry out. After a week or two, I will just um, cut the stems off and then I let them dry for another week or two. And once everything is just completely dried out, no place for moisture to be in the stem or anything, I will take those down to the root cellar. And that may sound complicated, but it really isn't. I mean, there's so much most of that time is just them laying on my porch. I'm not like in the house, heating the house up with canning, things like that. So, and as for broccoli, I freeze my broccoli, um, green beans. I just blanch and freeze a lot of my green beans. I will can some of them, but canning is actually not my favorite method of preservation. I think a lot of people, when they think of homesteaders, they think of, you know, just canning tons and tons of food. But canning is very time consuming and we have a very tiny house, it's like 1300 square feet, and that's not including our tiny basement. And um, we just, I just don't enjoy being in the kitchen (laughs) and I've gotten some flack for that. People are like, you're a homesteading person and you don't like the kitchen. And I'm like, I just prefer being outside growing this stuff and then I have to preserve it. But yeah, I just put my tomato, I just can my tomatoes up. I do all of our sauces and those are so handy to have during the winter time. I mean, they make for such fast meals. I do marinara sauce, barbecue, ketchup, and then um, chunk tomatoes, tomato juice, and salsa. I think that's really smart, though, to know that this is not something I actually like doing. So how am I going to maintain the motivation to can all of these things? And if you can figure out a way that you don't actually have to do that while still raising 75% of your food, I think that whatever method works best for you, I agree. Canning takes so long. And then I ultimately go through all of it really, really fast whenever I can something because it is so convenient once it's all done. It's like you spent all the time doing that and then you can just dump it in and go, yeah. which is great. But it's all that time on the front end that is really hard to commit to, especially when you have a lot of little kids. So I'm curious throughout the winter, what do your meals look like? Like what kind of staples do you rely on with a lot of these things that you've grown? What kind of meals are you making? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I, people ask me all the time, like, how do you make this lifestyle work? Like, how do you not just work yourself to death? How do you get everything done? And the answer for me is always just simplicity. So my meals are so simple. I, I don't do many casseroles that take all the different like canned tomato or canned mushroom soups and things like that. I just, I don't cook like that. So a typical week of meals will look like meatloaf and roasted potatoes with maybe a side of a tomato salad or um, pickles or something like that. 
Every now and then we will sub in spaghetti if we're getting a little bit tired of potatoes. So usually about once a week, I will do a noodle meal of some sort, like a lasagna or spaghetti. And I will also do things like butternut squash soup. I do stews, just very simple cooking. I do lots of bone broth. We raise all of our own chicken and beef. And so I have, I make a gallon of bone broth every single week. And I will use that just in soups and stews. I also do like steak and then sweet potato hash, basically just like very simple meat and potato meals. And I find that those are simple and they're also healthier because you don't have all the different, you know, add-ins and gravies and all the different things. And so everything is just, we just do very simple meals. And every Monday I actually go down to my root cellar and I bring up all the veggies that I want to use for the entire week. I also bring up all the meat that I want to use for the week. I thaw the meat in the fridge and then I just, I don't do any cooking on Mondays or it would be just way too overwhelming, but I just um, cut up and dice. Like if I'm doing sweet potato fries and meatloaf, I will get out two packages of hamburger and I'll figure out how many potatoes, how many sweet potatoes I need to make sweet potato fries. And I will just dice it up and stick it in my fridge. And so then when mealtime comes, I can just pull everything out. I can bring a meal together in literally 30 minutes sometimes. Yeah, I completely agree. Whenever you cook like that, like that's how my grandma cooked. And she cooked from scratch all the time. She had 14 kids. But it was meat and potatoes. You know, she wasn't like looking up new recipes all the time, which is great and it's fun, but it's not completely necessary. And those kind of meals, like you're describing, come together a lot more quickly than something even that we think of as convenience food. So the other day in my family text group, my sister, she was getting ready to go out and take her, her son's love to go harvest with my dad. And so she was making everybody sandwiches and she snapped a quick photo of like 20 sandwiches lined up because she has six kids and she and her husband and everybody always wants more than one. And she said, people on YouTube always ask me why I don't make simple meals for lunch, like sandwiches, instead of making like a real meal like I normally do. And this is why, because this is so much more work than just simple meat and potatoes. Yeah. All right, taking a quick break from this episode to tell you about my brand new course, Simple Sourdough. This one has been a long time coming. I have shared about sourdough over on my blog and my YouTube channel forever, but I finally compiled all of the information that you need to be successful with sourdough, uh, the starter, making your first ever loaves of bread, using the discard, so many things in my course, Simple Sourdough. You can find it at bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough course. That's all one word, bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough course. The coolest thing about the new simple sourdough course is that there's a corresponding private Facebook group that is for students only. I'm really excited that that'll be a place where when you have specific questions, there'll be other students in there, sourdough enthusiasts, and we can all learn from each other. This is usually such a valuable asset because a lot of times you'll have a specific question that you don't want to filter back through the course for. It's all there, but sometimes you just want other people who are on the same journey as you. And I'm really excited to provide that course, which just the lifetime membership comes with the purchase of the simple sourdough course. Again, you can find that at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse sourdough course. Okay. Now you mentioned meat and chickens a bit. What does that look like for your family? Do you prioritize meat, milk, eggs, uh, some of those nutrient dense, lots of fat? Uh, what does that look like on your homestead? So we, I have a bit of a dairy intolerance. I mean, I can handle dairy, but I don't like eat a ton of it. Cody, on the other hand, loves dairy. So it looks a little bit different for different members of our family. But yeah, we definitely do a lot of dairy. I, Cody loves creamy things more than tomato things. And so I do a lot of like, I'll make creamy meatballs instead of like tomato meatballs. So yeah, we definitely do a lot of dairy, especially a lot of butter. I find butter to be so beneficial for our health and it just makes everything so good. There's just nothing like putting a big dollop of butter on green beans or broccoli. People say they don't like vegetables and I'm like, put some 
good butter on it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anything is good with butter. So yes, we do lots of dairy, but we don't just like drink tons and tons of milk. Um, The children will drink a glass of milk with a cookie or something, but it's not something that we just drink down gallons and gallons of milk. I do make yogurt, so we definitely have um, lots of smoothies and yogurt is just a convenience meal around here. A nice snack for our kids. And then um, as for chicken and beef, I definitely prioritize those. I feel like protein is just so important in having us feel good, especially myself with my health journey. I have found meat to be so helpful in just helping me feel like I have, I just have more stamina when I eat a high protein diet. So I try to make sure that we have a lot of protein in our lunch and dinner. So meatloaf, meatballs, steak, roast beef, things like that. Yeah. Those are all similar things. That's what I was trying to, a lot of times people want like okay, how do I actually then take this and then do something with it? And I think it's encouraging to hear just focusing on protein and simple meals. I have two pounds of moose meat sitting in my fridge right now. That's going to be meatloaf tonight for dinner. Same, same thing as you, lots of meat, high protein. Um, that, that diet is, has been villainized over the last several years. And I think people are starting to uh, come back around that they feel good on, or at least a lot of people, not everybody, but on, on diets like that. And so that's definitely how I've nourished my family over the last uh, several years. We don't actually raise our own meat, but we do uh, get it from my sister's farm and then we raise dairy. And so we have a lot of dairy, cheese, yogurt, butter. Uh, We drink a lot of milk, you know, all that kind of stuff. So when it comes to planning, I don't know, when does this happen for your family? Like what, what time of the year are you thinking about the, the next year? Maybe it's an ongoing thing, but how does the planning phase look so that you can be sure that you're going to be able to, again, grow 75% of your food the following year? Yes. So I see channels where people like weigh all the vegetables that they bring in and they're like so on top of their game in that way. We really aren't like that. I kind of keep a very uh, loose log of what I plant the year before. And then as we're going through the winter, I'm like, oh, it would be it would be nice if I had more broccoli or it'd be nice if I had more potatoes. And then I'll just make a mental note of that and I'll plant a little bit more the next year. Like as in potatoes, this year we ran out of potatoes or last year we ran out of potatoes. And so this year I just ordered an extra 10 pound bag and we planted 40 pounds of potatoes this year instead of 30 pounds like we did last year. So planning for the next year is usually, usually like in the fall, I'm kind of over the whole gardening thing and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take a break. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But The winter months hit and I start dreaming about the sunshine, then I'm ready to start thinking about my garden again. So I will just like pour over seed catalogs, things like that. And really we keep everything very simple in our garden. And so it's not like I'm buying all sorts of different varieties. I usually stick with things that are tested. Tried and true is one of my mottos. I just, if it's not broken, why fix it? Mm -hmm. So I just pour over seed catalogs and things like that. My favorite place to buy our seeds and things like that is Berlin Seed. They are out of Holmes County. It's an Amish company, so you can't order things online, but they're very reliable. They're honest, all the things. So we just put in our seed order. We try to do it relatively early so that because the one year, lots of seeds were out of stock. I think it was over 2020 and all the madness Mm -hmm. So we just try to um, get our seed order in soon enough that we won't have any issues with um, them being out of things. And yeah, we just order our seeds usually in February to March is when I start planting my peppers and tomatoes and any herbs and flowers that I want to start on my own. I'll start growing those. I do go to a greenhouse to buy some of the more things that I find a little bit more difficult to start at home, I will get from a greenhouse. I buy my broccoli and I'm trying to think. I also order in like onion, 
sets or onion plants. I don't start those myself. It's just, it's kind of a big hassle to start that many onion seeds. And I find that it's just efficient to buy them. And then of course we, Berlin seeds will send us all of those things at the right time of the year. So we don't have to order them when we need them. We can just order them and they will come once it's the correct time of year, which is super nice. Oh, that is nice. That is so nice. I have done that with the onion company that we order from, but I didn't realize that there was companies that did other things as well, which makes a lot of sense. So I guess they just go by what zone you're in and then send you whenever, you know, it's time for that. It's it's a really neat way to plan. So with your garden, are you doing mostly raised beds and then how many raised beds and what are you filling them with? What does that look like for you? Yes. So, um, this year, my husband, I'm, I'm so spoiled with a husband who can build things. He built me like 10 raised beds. So I think I have 12 in all. And I am absolutely just loving raised beds. People ask me all the time, like, you know, if my partner doesn't, you know, want to do this lifestyle, but I do, you know, what could I do? And I'm just like, man, get yourself some raised beds because the weed pressure is so minimal in raised beds, at least in my experience, it's, there's just so much easier to maintain. So I do 12 raised beds this year. I did carrots, green beans, sweet potatoes, peppers, broccoli, cabbage, cucumbers, and butternut squash all in raised beds. And it was, it was just amazing. I feel like I spent less time in my garden this year than any other year. And we've never grown as much food in our garden as we have this year. So definitely raised beds are awesome. I haven't, I'm not completely converted to raised beds. I can't quite see that like growing white potatoes in raised beds is more efficient than just in the ground because we have such a large area that we cover with white potatoes, but maybe I'll try it sometime. I've been surprised with other things. So we do a huge bed, uh, like we have a front garden and we fill that with white potatoes usually. And we just do that in the ground. We mulch everything with leaves. And then our strawberries, I don't have those in raised beds either. I feel like if we did everything in raised beds, we would just have to have so many raised beds. Mm -hmm. So I still do certain things just in the garden. We also have a big asparagus patch. I don't have those in raised beds. And my tomatoes, I don't do in raised beds either. I don't see a huge point in putting something like that in a raised bed. But everything that's not in a raised bed, I just mulch it very heavily with shredded leaves so that I don't have to be weeding all the time. Yeah. I want to interrupt this episode real quick to tell you about one of my favorite sponsors, and that is Tubes & Co. Just this morning, actually, I got a text from my mom to our sisters, our entire family group, who needs to place a tubes order. I need some new foundation. Anyone want to throw something on for free shipping? But I had already just gotten in my new order that I ordered a couple of weeks ago of my Tubes & Co. makeup. We all just love it so much. It has natural and organic, clean ingredients. Nothing that you have to worry about as you are trying to improve your health, cook more clean in your home. Sometimes we forget about skincare and our skin is our body's largest organ. So what goes on there can actually make its way in and affect our health. It's hard to find high quality products. You don't feel like you're sacrificing how you usually do your makeup or your skincare. When normally I feel like with brands that are cleaner, you get the cleaner ingredients, but you sacrifice kind of the quality, the feel. Not the case with Tubes & Co. I have the foundation, the eyebrow pencil, the mascara, the palette for eyeshadow. I also really love the skincare. So their moisturizers are really great this time of year. As it's getting colder, I need something to moisturize my skin and I love their tallow balm because again, it's all clean, natural ingredients. Tallow from grass-fed cows. It doesn't just sit on the skin, it actually makes its way in. So just the whole thing. All their products, I've tried so many of them. Every single one I've tried, I have loved. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off over on their website, tubesandco.com, with the code FARMHOUSE. Again, that's T-O-U-P-S and co.com. 
Use the code FARMHOUSE to get 10% off. Tubes & Co is a small, family-run, made-in-America company. You can feel really good about supporting and good about the ingredients that's going on your skin. Again, thanks to Tubes & Co for sponsoring today's episode. Yeah, that's definitely a, a problem that a lot of people actually had. I was, I, we did an audience questionnaire over on Instagram and weeds was a question a lot of people had. And then another question that kind of goes along with this, because whenever you, you put this in very smart, maybe it's, it's less time, but was about time management and productivity and burnout. Someone says, I'd love to know more about what Michelle does to heal from burnout and how to stay out of it. What are your strategies for that? I really love that question. It's something I'm just like hugely passionate about because uh, I'm going to say we were, we've been married for 11 years now. And for the first like eight years of our marriage, I was pretty sick. It kind of happened after my first baby, I started noticing some health issues and then it got really bad after my third child. It just didn't go away. I had three babies like right close together. So my kids now are 10, 9, and 7. So it basically was, I was diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, just very low adrenals. And so that kind of started me on this journey of of healing. And you can't, I think one thing that's just so important to remember is that you cannot heal in the same environment that made you sick. And so I really had to start figuring out how to change my lifestyle. First of all, I started working with a nutritionalist, which was terribly expensive. And I took so many supplements. I was taking like 60 to hundred pills a day wow. for like five solid years, which was kind of exhausting in itself. I don't necessarily regret it. I'm thankful because I feel like those supplements really helped to keep me, they helped to keep me going. But I found where I found the most healing was in changing my lifestyle and just prioritizing rest. And so when people ask me, like, how do you do it all? I just, number one, I don't do it all. I know everybody says that, but I think it's important to say I don't do it all. But I just have some things that I really focus on to just minimize my stress and I think it's just so important to figure out like what is it that is stressing you personally out because different people have different mm -hmm. stressors. So figuring out your own body and what stresses you out personally, I think is just such a big deal for myself. Doing too many things at once is just a really huge problem for me. So um, I don't homeschool while I'm gardening. I just, I'm usually the last mom <laughs> to start homeschooling. And I've just learned that I have to just accept that and be okay mm -hmm. with it. And I've learned to not let it intimidate me at all. So I wait until October to start homeschooling. And then we quit homeschooling in May when gardening season really starts to pick up and it works out great. We double up some days and um, my children have a two hour rest period every day where they go upstairs and they read. And I have found that really helps them to maintain what they've learned and to not lose a lot of stuff over the summer. Um, they do that year round. So I really love that. Another thing that personally affects me is clutter. And so I'm really big on minimalism, mm -hmm. just minimizing anything that I can. I minimize my kids clothes. I minimize makeup and even just like decor. I try to just do seasonal items like pumpkins and pine needles and things like that. And then I can just throw them away. They don't sit in my house. And it just helps my brain to work so much better if there's not lots of clutter around. Yeah. One major switch that we made that really helped me with my burnout was we were doing farmer's market for a few years. And it was so, so stressful for me because I would grow all of this food and package it up, take it to farmer's market and one Saturday, everything might sell. Another Saturday, it might be a little bit rainy and like almost nothing sold. And so I'd bring all this food back and have to just like hand it out to my friends for free or try to preserve it, you know, all this food at one time. And it was so, so stressful. And so we recognized that that was taking a toll on our health. We were both getting severely burned out. 
And so we just decided to phase out of that and look for something that fit our lifestyle better. So I just think that recognizing your stressors, recognizing the things that stress you personally out the most is just such a huge part and also just respecting your limitations. So for example, this year, my tomatoes just went bonkers. I had so many tomatoes, like hundreds of pounds of tomatoes. And I canned more tomatoes this year than I ever have. And we ended up having to like go buy more jars. And all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, we don't even need all of these tomatoes. And I just quit. I was like, you know what? I'm starting to feel burned out. And so I just stopped. And the same with raspberries. We had so many raspberries this year. And, you know, I feel like I'm wasting if I don't put them away. But I was like, no, the birds can eat them. They can fall to the ground and, you know, bring fertility Mm -hmm. to the soil. And so I think just respecting your limitations is so helpful in keeping burnout from setting in. Yeah, I think that's all really smart. One thing you talked about was the whole decluttering thing. And Dawn from The Minimal Mom, she calls the she calls whenever you have something that you're not really using or that you have to maintain the silent to-do list. Because every time you walk past it, it's something that you're, even though it's not a big deal, it's just sitting there, your brain registers it as that's something that I need to take care of. Oh, I need to dust that thing or I need to declutter it or whatever it may be. I need to move that to the right spot. So I think that we all recognize this, that somehow we tend to function a little bit better whenever there's less things for us to manage, but it's hard to put it to words. And that silent to-do list thing really like that, that really made an impression on me when I heard her say that, because I completely agree. There's so many things that are like yelling at you throughout your house. Like even the stuff in the basement, we have a little bit of storage in our basement and Every once in a while, I'll just put something down there when I'm not really ready to deal with it. Like, I don't know if I want to get rid of it or if I want to sell it or what I want to do. And then over time, there's this stuff in the basement and then we need to keep like the dehumidifier running in the basement. It's it's like, is that stuff getting ruined? And it's this little nagging thing where I probably just should have gotten rid of that item in the first place because now I have a big decluttering day ahead of me. So I think that's really smart. And I think a lot of moms can relate to that. With you having four kids, I'm sure that this is something you deal with all the time. Yes, it definitely is. <laughs> I'm constantly like throwing things out and the kids are like, if they lose something, they're like, mom, what did you do with it? <laughs> and I definitely try to respect their property and all of that stuff. But I, yeah, clutter just, it clutters your mind. It makes you anxious. And there's actually so many studies that are done that show that it actually will Release when a person walks into a cluttered room, a cluttered space, it will actually um, prompt the body to release stress hormones, release cortisol. So, yeah, there's definitely science behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then with the homeschooling thing, you said you don't really start till October, but I'm sure you get your kids in some way involved in the garden. So, I would argue that that's homeschool in a different way. In what ways? Do you uh, involve the children in that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, 100%. And that's part of the reason why I just don't stress out about not having them in quote unquote proper school until October. So our children do animal chores. They, We have a dog. We have chickens. For a while, we had 150 chickens and we were selling eggs at a grocery store. And my kids all helped with that. We try to be very intentional about teaching them how to make money and that you can, we try to make sure that they are able to make money when they do a good job. So we don't pay them for just chores around the house. But for example, this spring, we have a huge asparagus patch. It's like a hundred plants. And we're planning to take some of those out this year because it's just overwhelming. But um, asparagus sells super well. And so I told my daughter, she's eight years old, I told her, you know, if you take care of this asparagus, we will let you keep the money that you make off of it. And she made Mm -hmm. like, she made a lot of money. She made at least $300. And I think we ended up only giving her half. And she, it taught her responsibility. And to me, that's school. You know, she was learning how to save money, how to make money, what it takes to make money. And so, yeah, we just let them do things around the house and help with the chores and 
all things farming. Yeah. No, I, I would 100% argue that that school, it's funny because what's the goal of school? It's to foster uh, responsibility so that you have an adult who knows how to navigate the world. So if that's school, then these real life examples are definitely, definitely school. Sometimes in traditional school, we try to like take that concept and then make like an artificial version of it. And so I don't, I can't feel guilty for prioritizing things like that. I just can't. Absolutely. I love that. All right. Tell the viewers about your YouTube channel or whatever else you offer and, and where to find you. Yeah. So we are over on YouTube at More Than Farmers. And our channel is all about how to be more self-sustainable, how to grow your own food, and how to do it efficiently, and how to escape burnout. We're both so passionate about doing things in a sustainable way, not just like sustainable as in good for the earth and all the things like that, but sustainable in that you'll be able to do it for the long haul and not give up because it's so hard. I think there's just this huge influx of homesteaders and so many of the people that are coming to us are beginners and I want to see them succeed. And I think in order to in order for new homesteaders to succeed, they have to be very gracious with themselves and yeah, that's just that is our passion is to help this new influx of homesteaders succeed and not just give up in a few years. So you can find us over on YouTube at More Than Farmers. And then I'm also on Instagram at the same name, More Than Farmers. So I just share on Instagram. Instagram is more me and kind of my view of our homestead. And then YouTube is more of a joint effort with me and Cody. So, so much practical wisdom over there for a, a generation of, of people who want to do this. So I think that they'll find a lot of value in finding you over there on YouTube and on Instagram. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for joining me and sharing all that you've learned over a lifetime. And there's so much more for people to go follow along and learn from you. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. This was great. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Any resources that Michelle mentioned and the link to her YouTube channel, It'll all be linked in the description box below or the show notes, wherever it is you are listening or watching. As always, thank you for listening. I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.